ingredients uh, right for your diet that are right for your good evening everyone good evening. hello we're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes we're just waiting for a couple of folks to join us um, we have a pretty decent sized group on this Zoom tonight, so um, just taking an extra minute for everyone to log in. All right. I'm just going to give one more second. Oh. You just heard a parakeet. <laughs> okay. I want to thank all of you for logging in on time. Thank you so much. We are going to get started in just a minute. Um, but before I turn things over to Stephanie, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Rebecca. I'm the Director of Outreach, Marketing, and Events at Wild Care. Um, and we are very excited to have you join us this evening. Throughout the presentation, I will be monitoring our chat function so you can ask any questions in there. We are going to ask everyone to stay muted throughout the presentation. It's a lot easier for Stephanie to go through all of her slides and share all of the details and photos and videos if there isn't a whole bunch of background noise. Um, so we will ask you to ask any questions through that chat function and I will field them to her probably closer to the end, but if it's really important and interruptible, I will jump in. Um, after this, if you are thinking about joining Stephanie next year in the Galapagos on our amazing fundraising trip that she is taking in October of 2021, you can send me a quick message and I am happy to share the Zoom link with you. She is gonna do a Q&A for anyone who is on the fence about next year's trip, thinking about joining, but maybe has a couple of questions about how the travel goes, safety, what to expect a day on the ship, the food, the entertainment, nap time, showers, any of those questions, she's happy to answer all of them. Um, we can tell you from, you'll see her photos that the Nat Geo ship is amazing. You will not get seasick, but she'll cover that as well. Um, there's a doctor on board and she had a life-changing experience last time she was there, which you're even, you are going to enjoy over the next hour. And if you'd like to support Wild Care and also have a life-changing experience in the Galapagos, you can join Stephanie next year. So send me a quick note in the chat function and I'm happy to share that information with you. And without further ado, I will turn you over to our Executive Director, Stephanie Ellis. Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. I am going to share my screen. See speaker view. There, Rebecca, can you see that? Okay, great. And I just want everyone to know that if I disappear for a second because of connectivity, um, don't panic. I will switch over to another Wi-Fi network. Uh, this morning I gave a talk and I was cut off in front of all, <laughs> all the viewers, um, but the Wi-Fi seems to be much better now. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you really enjoy this presentation. Um, it's a trip that changed my life and I'm really excited to share it. Um, this is a picture of blue-footed boobies and this is a picture of the National Geographic Endeavor, which was my home on the sea for seven days and this was last December. And so let's talk about the Galapagos. So where are the Galapagos Islands located? Um, they are located about 600 miles offshore off the coast of Ecuador. When you visit the Galapagos, uh, you fly from Guayaquil and uh, fly to San Cristobal. And then from there, um, that's where the National Geographic boat picked us up, and then we began our adventure. 
And so this presentation, actually, I'm going to go through um, all seven days of what I experienced on the boat, the highlights, and it will give you an idea of what it was like. So these, uh, the Galapagos Islands are remote, and it is an archipelago of islands that consists of um, over 17,000 square miles of ocean and land. And what's so fascinating about Galapagos is um, it is volcanic. And over millions of years, these volcanoes have been active, dormant. There are still active volcanoes, and so the land is constantly reshaped. Um, there are 42 islets out there. Um, and when you think about Galapagos, I've thought of this since childhood, I always think of Darwin, because of course this archipelago inspired Darwin's theory of evolution. And Darwin recognized that um, all the islands, though, though similar, are, offer very different unique habitats. And so species evolved uh, to suit those habitats. So I, you especially think about the Darwin finches, all different shapes, all different sizes, all different beaks for the various islands. Galapagos is also extremely special because it's home to over 2,000 endemic species. And um, endemic means those are species that can only be found there. So this is uh, plants and animals. So that's pretty incredible. You can only go there to see certain things. And I almost missed it, but um, Galapagos is also the northernmost home of penguins. Um, and that is because of cold water currents that run through the islands. So Galapagos Islands, they straddle the equator, which I learned really quickly. Uh, when you're at the equator, you're very close to the sun. And so you, the sun is very strong, uh, very bright and very beautiful. And it's important to make sure that you protect your scalp so when you're snorkeling, you don't get a sunburn on your head. Um, the, the climate year round is so temperate. It's the perfect climate. There was one day where I think it was 82 or 83 degrees and that felt hot, you know, compared to it's normally 65 through 85 um, throughout the year. So really perfect environment. We were there in December, which is considered uh, the end of their drought season. And you will see what that looks like. Um, and even so, it was still very lush on many of the islands. Um, so uh, the Antarctic current, five ocean currents converge here in the Galapagos archipelago, including the Antarctic Humboldt current, which is what allows these penguins to live there. Uh, but these penguins, you know, it's still, it's a warm environment for them. I mean, when you think penguins, you think Antarctica. So again, this is their northernmost range. Um, importantly, Galapagos Islands are a national marine reserve, and they are controlled by Ecuador's national parks. So Ecuadorian government manages these islands and manages them very well. You will learn as we go throughout my presentation. Okay, um, so let's start with day one of my journey. Uh, so we flew to San Cristobal. I think it was a 30, might have been a 30 minute flight um, from Guayaquil. And San Cristobal is one of four islands in the archipelago that is actually populated. So if you visit Galapagos, um, other than those four islands where people live, uh, you cannot enter the other islands without being with a guided group. Uh, Ecuador National Parks, they're very strict about the number of people who visit the lands, and so you have to be with a guide. So um, the first day, so we get off the plane, we take a bus, we go to this port, this is San Cristobal, and we're greeted by National Geographic staff and this zodiac. And I was so excited, the waters were blue, green, beautiful, and then I, I see this ship off in the distance, and this was the National Geographic Endeavor too. And so you can see it's, um, it's a 96 passenger boat and it's just the right size. Um, it's like a small cruise ship and there was ample space, you know, for solitude um, and just beautiful dining areas. It was really exquisite. So this was my home on the water for the next seven days. You can see the Zodiac and they're greeting us and helping us in. And then we basically got on the boat. There was um, an introduction to 
you know, the day to day, how things work, excuse me, doctor on the boat, safety. Um, and then we actually, we got settled in our rooms and then we were able to um, go to another part of San Cristobal and disembark. So we went to Puerto Bacarizo Moreno, and this is the capital of Galapagos. And here is where I had my first introduction to the friendly or approachable wildlife. Um, you can see the sea lion here who was just laying right in the, the sort of center of town, um, laying next to a bicycle. Someone almost actually stepped on him because she didn't even notice him. Um, Puerto Bacarizo is the largest, home to the largest population of Galapagos sea lions um, of any of the Galapagos islands. And so we got to see, I don't think I have a photo. Oh, I do have a photo. We actually were able to see what we call a creche or nurseries of Galapagos sea lions. Um, it was mothers nursing their pups. And a creche is a nursery of pups where they stay together for safety, um, and for warmth when they're really young and they wait for their mother to return from the sea in the afternoon or evening to nurse them. So I hope you guys like sea lions because there's a ton of them in this presentation. And Galapagos sea lion, anything with the name Galapagos means um, they can only be found there. They are endemic. I just want to point out again when I stepped, you know, I stepped out of the zodiac into this port and the water was blue green there were pacific green sea turtles the beaches are filled with sea lions and their pups um, and i also had seen my first of the sally lightfoot crabs which i will show you soon and it was just teeming with life and we spent about an hour there and then again this was our first day getting on the boat so then we go back to the boat we have a dinner there's captain's cocktails there's usually a talk at the end of the day and a recap and um, you go to sleep and then you get excited for the next day. So the next day we were going to Española Island. And um, I think this was my favorite island. It's hard to list a favorite because they were all extraordinary. Uh, but you can see here the white sands, the green water. This is um, an Española mockingbird. So an endemic species only seen on Española. And this is a sea lion being goofy on the shore. And um, just to show you, let's see, so Española, so we had landed in San Cristobal and then the next day we traveled to Española. And these are the eastern islands of Galapagos and this was southeast. And an important thing to know is the boat is traveling in the evening. So I didn't even notice that we were traveling and then in the morning you wake up and you're in a new location so that you can take the zodiac um, and go to another island so here we are i was getting ready to uh, go snorkeling and explore espanola this is what the zodiacs look like i believe they see 12 people um, so they pack you in you wear life jackets it's very very safe and the drivers are all um native uh from Galapagos and really skilled at what they do. So when we went to uh, first Gardner Bay of the island of Española, the water was so beautiful. And um, being a Cape Codder, I wasn't afraid to go in, even though I think it was probably between 65 and 70 degrees. Um, and so, I went in the water and I had my first sea lion interaction where I was in the water and the sea lion was barking and barking and passing by. And what he was doing was he was warning males to stay away from his harem. And I was not a part of his harem. In fact, he did not even pay any attention to me. It was like I was a rock in the water. And this is just an example of how the animals are you're either unseen um, or they approach you sometimes with curiosity. And so uh, a gentleman on the boat took this photo and I'm so glad that he did. I need, my mother wants me to frame it for her, but I'm really glad I got into the water that day. <laughs> the look of pure joy. I don't know about him. 
so this is also where I get to see the, the quintessential Galapagos crabs that everyone loves, the Sally Lightfoot crab, these brilliantly orange crabs, which are also somewhat approachable, honestly. They, um, they let you get a really good look at them. Galapagos is probably the best place on the planet for photography because these creatures are so approachable. And I'm going to play a little video for you here. I'm gonna turn up my sound first. And you are going to see the Española mockingbirds, they'll move right and you'll hear them and you'll see all the crabs sort of scurry out of the way. <laughs> so I hope you can see all the crabs there and also that you can see um, the volcanic rock. It's all uh, lava and just really, really interesting landscape. Oops, didn't mean to play that one again. Here's a beautiful image. My friend Elizabeth took me on this trip and uh, much of the photography in this presentation is from her and she captured some truly beautiful moments. These are just extraordinary creatures. Okay, so then that's the morning trip. And then um, you go back, you freshen up, there's usually some kind of presentation or a photography demonstration, lunch, and then you can get ready to go on the second trip of the day if you wish. And of course, I didn't, I didn't want to miss anything. Um, so I went in the afternoon, we disembarked and we went to another part of Española. And I loved, here's where we saw another nursery of um, Galapagos sea lion pups. I'm going to play this video for you. <laughs> Notice all the animals in the water. <laughs> So I don't know if you can hear me laughing, um, but the reason I'm laughing is because our guide, his name was Salvador, he was telling us that um, the sea lion pups, they love to grab the marine iguanas by the tail in the water and hold them underwater. And they think it's this such a fun, fun game. Of course, it's fun for them, but it's not fun for the marine iguana who cannot breathe underwater. And um, also, if you noticed in the water, so these pups are on the beach and they look helpless, but they're not. Um, they were playing with sticks and stones and playing with each other. And notice all the pups in the water. They are learning to swim and to catch prey. And this is a safe place for them, a sheltered area away from hammerhead sharks and other predators where they wait for their mom to return at the end of the day. So I just loved that. I love this photo, it's the mothership. And look at this marine iguana in the front. He's like, ah, it looks like Godzilla to me every time. <laughs> um, the marine iguanas, holy lizard. They told me I would see marine iguanas and I have never seen anything like it. Um, our guide said to us, do not step on their tail. Be cautious to not step on their tail. And I didn't know what he meant until I saw how many of them there were on this island. We literally had to clear a path here so that um, we could walk through. And otherwise they're just sitting and sunbathing. And look at this exquisite male. Um, the marine iguanas in December were going into their breeding condition and they take on these gorgeous colors um, and to attract the females. It was beautiful to see the varying degrees of color on all of them and look at these nails. By the way, these are um, the only marine lizards, uh, reptiles in the world. So if you want to see a marine reptile, you need to go to the Galapagos. And these guys actually drink and excrete salt through their nose. So not only are they laying around being beautiful, but they're blowing salt spray out of their nose all the time. Prehistoric creatures. Also on Española, um, our timing was perfect because the waved albatross were nesting. Um, these birds absolutely just took my, my heart away. They're so incredibly beautiful. Uh, this is, these are my own photos. 
we're walking very close within feet. Um, we, all, we make sure we stay at least six feet away from the animals, um, but we're very close. And you can see that there is a chick here, this big brown blob was a waved albatross chick. Uh, these birds were absolutely exquisite and they were sitting on eggs or had chicks. So I was thrilled to be able to see them. Española is the only island that they nest on in the Galapagos. Here's another pup, can't get enough. Um, and my favorite bird from the trip, I had wanted to see this bird more than anything. Um, this is the Nazca booby, related to our northern gannets and our double-crested cormorants and brown pelican. I don't know if you can see here, there's a lot of whitewash bird poop, but dotted throughout are also birds. So they're nesting in this rocky, this volcanic um, flat area. And by the way, this location, you know, it's like being on a flattened volcano. So what's not to love? Look at the faces of these birds. And they have a really silly, whimsical call. Um, and their name, Nazca, is, is um, it refers back to the tectonic plates, the Nazca plates that form Galapagos. It's not related to NASCAR, um, the racing cars. <laughs> Just FYI. So here's a look at the Española landscape. Beautiful, isn't it? Very prehistoric looking, volcanic. Um, look at these colors. This reminded me of home, a fall on Cape Cod or in Massachusetts uh, with the changing colors. And you can see here the drought. You know, so it was not very lush at this, on this particular island. And you can see an albatross head here. Uh, there was a blowhole where water was spouting up and the water would just come across. And I had to be reminded, I felt like I was in a completely other time in other place. And um, the only animal who showed a little bit of aggression during the trip, and I hate to use the word aggression because that's too harsh, uh, but this guy, when our group was walking through, he wanted us to stay away from his harem of females. So he actually charged us, and only half-heartedly. But look at that face. <laughs> what an incredible face. He has a heart for a nose. Our guide said, let's go. You know, we don't want to, um, we don't want to upset the animals, of course, and then he just watched us as we moved away. But our guide was laughing. This is a beautiful video. So this is the before dusk. We were getting ready to leave the island and mothers were returning to nurse their pups. And so I captured this video on my iPhone. So I hope that you can hear that. It's a very beautiful reunion to witness. And then there was a pup off to the side. This is not his mother, he's waiting for his mother. And I'm sure she probably returned. Um, but the reunion is incredible. A lot of touching, a lot of vocalization. I was very sad to leave Espanola and I couldn't believe this was my first day. Um, what, a, what an extraordinary experience. Okay, so the next day uh, we were off to the island of Floriana and this was a special 6 a.m. disembarkation. So an extra trip if you're up for it. And I am not an early bird, but I was an early bird on this trip because I didn't want to miss anything. So I'm so glad that I woke up early because it was totally worth it. First of all, this was the landscape that I woke up to. And like I said, the boat travels at night. So in the morning you wake up and you're in a completely different place. Um, Floriana is also one of the Eastern islands, Southeastern islands. So we were here. Um, this is my dear friend, Elizabeth. She is an early bird. So she was like bright and bushy tailed and ready. Here are our boats waiting for us and our drivers, or I guess you would call them captains. And here's what we saw when we got onto Floriana. 
uh, flamingos. And you guys, I brought my field guide and I had studied what I was going to see and I did not even consider flamingos. And they were exquisite and we saw lots of them. Um, I think I have, I do have some close-ups in here. We even saw young flamingos being fed by their, by the adults. So this was the landscape on Floriana. And by the way, uh, every group, so it's a group of 12, <laughs> um, no other tour groups are on the island when you are. You are with National Geographic um, and they do have other zodiacs of 12 going to different parts of the island, but there won't be any, you won't see any other people on the island with you when you're traveling with National Geographic. So this here was um, a sea turtle had just nested. Ah, there's, this is an adult flamingo and a young flamingo. They're both beautiful and look very different, don't they? And this was the landscape. I think it was the one day with a stormy sky. It only drizzled once. We didn't get rain or bad weather. And I stepped into the water and there were about, I think around 10 or 12 stingrays in the water here. So again, you know, Galapagos, it's a national marine reserve for a reason. It is teeming with life, land, air, and sea. Uh, this was one of our guides and he was just talking about um, these bones and sea urchins. And I didn't take many pictures of flowers because I was focused on the wildlife. But the flowers, even in the drought season, were very beautiful, very colorful, attracting pollinators, um, insects, and birds. This was my first up-close blue-footed booby, and this booby did not have blue feet. And that's because it's a juvenile. You can see all the fresh new feathers. It doesn't have a blue beak yet, but it was still beautiful. Okay, so I recall we went back to the boat, we had a breakfast, and then we get ready to go out on our next disembarkation to another place. And I decided to go on a Zodiac ride um, into the Champion Islet around Floriana. And here's an example of what Floriana looked like. If you can see the cactuses, the cacti, very desert-like, volcanic, there's sleepy Galapagos sea lions, there's crabs. And I apologize for this graphic image, but when we were in this islet, something incredible happened. We saw two magnificent frigate birds who are these very large, um, sort of ominous looking birds, deeply forked wings, forked tail, large birds. They're referred to as the pirate of the sea because they like to steal prey from other animals. And what happened was um, these two birds had, were carrying something and they were like twirling around in the sky and dropping it and picking it up. And it was this huge display. And imagine we're in this little islet um, surrounded by volcanic cliff. We're sort of isolated, beautiful spot. And these birds are doing this right in front of us. And what was happening was they actually had a, a chick, a swallowtailed gull chick, which is a sad thing to see. Um, and then what happened next was crazy because the, the frigate bird dropped it on me. And, you know, some of the people in the boat know my field of work where we try to care for things and, and release them back into the wild. And so this bird dropped this on me in the zodiac. And I picked it up and fortunately, you know, it was just about deceased. Um, so I threw it back to the birds and everyone in the Zodiac was freaking out. Our guide was freaking out, you know, taking photos. And even though it was a horrible thing to experience, um, it, is, it was an actual example of nature. Um, this is what they do. And so uh, even our, our guide couldn't believe how close the birds were to us and what had happened. So you never know what will happen in Galapagos. So after that Zodiac trip, I decided that I wanted to go deep water snorkeling um, near the, the Champion Islet. And I'm so glad I did because I had an incredible interaction with Galapagos sea lions. I'm going to play this video, it's a little bit jerky, but you'll see this sea lion is incredibly curious 
and approaches us and approaches me and sort of turns around, turns upside down to get a better look at my face. <laughs> I love that so much. I'm not sure, um, I don't have good video editing skills, so I'm not sure how to slow it down more. What a beautiful animal. They are so playful and they don't try to touch you and I don't try to touch them. I'm in their environment and my intention is not to harass, it's to enjoy. So here's another interaction with a sea lion that I love. And this is using an underwater GoPro. <laughs> And I hope you can hear that sound because that was a sound that I came to recognize of a descending or ascending sea lion. When I would hear that sound, all the fish would scatter and I knew that a sea lion was near me. So I started to get excited when I would hear that because I knew they were close. But, um, but you could see this animal came right up to my face. I sort of was like, ah, you know, I, you just don't expect it. And they're just checking you out. Um, they just want to play. He looked right at me. I can say that a, a sea lion looked right into my eyes. It's really fascinating. And here is an example also, if you go snorkeling, um, they have several options. You can go deep water snorkeling, um, which does, does not mean that you're going deep under the surface. It means you are in deeper water with uh, rocky canyons, or you can uh, go bay snorkeling. Or if you don't want to snorkel at all, they have a glass bottom zodiac, which is fantastic. There's also kayaking and paddleboarding opportunities. Um, but this is an example. I was deep water snorkeling and I wanted to show you what it looks like above the water and below. So the water was just absolutely filled with fish and marine life. Um, coral and sea urchins and starfish and the fish were always just ahead of me. You feel like you can touch them, but they're always out of reach, of course. Uh, so really, really, the snorkeling was incredible. The water quality was very clear. I had never used a GoPro before and I'm, I almost didn't use it and I'm so glad that I did. Okay, so Whenever you um, get back onto the boat from your Zodiac, uh, they give you this amazing drink with native fruit. And at first I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna eat a lot and I'm not gonna drink a lot. And believe me, you do not wanna miss out. The drinks were so refreshing and re replenishing. So I looked forward to that every time I got off the boat. And um, on the boat, I'm sorry. And then when you get on the boat, there's this board at the back of the boat, and you can see I was room number 320. And this is a board where you move the pins to show if you are on board or outboard. So it became really important <laughs> that you make sure you move your pin to show that you're on board. Otherwise, at the dinner in the evening, you would be publicly shamed when they call out the room numbers of the people who are supposedly you know, lost at sea somewhere because they never moved their pin to show that they were on board. So my friend Elizabeth always forgot to remove, to move her pin. And so I would always say she was on board, even though I didn't know where she was. <laughs> but I, I figured there was a high likelihood. The boat is so safe. Um, I figured there's a high likelihood that she was back on board. Um, anyway, the next day, that this was December 3rd, this was the one day where we were on land for the entire day. And that's because we went to Santa Cruz 
uh, which is has the largest population of people of any of the Galapagos, the four Galapagos Islands where people live. And Santa Cruz is here. So we went to Santa Cruz because here is where you will see the giant tortoises. And the first thing that we did is we went to the Darwin Research Institute. This is a really special and important place. Um, this is a place that has been doing captive breeding of Galapagos tortoises and reintroducing them to various islands uh, where they became uh, extirpated. And so you can see here, I saw 1,286 tortoises at this facility. And I'll explain what they do. I love this sign. This is my number one sign, the best sign I've ever seen in my entire life, which basically says, you know, iguanas and tortoises this way. That is all we need in the world. <laughs> so at this research institute, I met a very special tortoise. His name is Diego. And probably many of you have seen Diego on the news because he's made headlines most recently because Diego is the playboy tor tortoise who had so much sex that he saved his entire species. Um, Diego, I think I have another slide about him. What happened was um, in the 1700s when whalers found the Galapagos Islands, they weren't the first people to find it, but they were the first people to really exploit it. Um, they would take tortoises, sometimes stacked 200 tortoises high. They learned that tortoises can survive with no food or water for months. So they would store them on boats and literally have a meal on a shell. Um, forgive me for being so crass, but that's what it was. And so um, sadly, by 1960, there was a population on Española Island of 15 tortoises. So the, their population was just decimated. There are other reasons why, which we'll get into later. Um, Diego, he was taken from Española, they believe in the 1930s, and he was placed into the San Diego Zoo. And then some 30 something years later, actually I think in the 70s, he was brought to the Darwin Institute and they started breeding him um, to help to repopulate the tortoises on Española. And so you can see now, he actually has populated 40% of the tortoises on the island of Española and fathered 800 offspring. And the current population there is um, over 2,300 tortoises. And so this is pretty, actually, um, I'm sorry, their population in total for Galapagos is 2,300. Diego was just released, you guys, back to Española. After nearly 100 years in captivity, he's back home. And so this is what it looked like, the tortoises that have been raised in captivity. Once they're five years old, they no longer have any, um, they no longer have any threats other than humans, but these islands that they're going back to are not, they don't have people on them, so they don't have to worry about vehicles and things like that. So these are tiny tortoises. And this is what a land iguana looks like. Very different than the marine iguana, beautiful creature. And this is at the Research Institute, but the reason that I took this photo is because the ones I saw in the wild, I was not quite as close. And so this is to show you what they look like. Beautiful sunbathing creatures. So on Santa Cruz, we went to Puerto Ayora and there's a tiny little fish market there. It literally consists of this table. I could have spent all day there because the fish market attracts wildlife. You can see this sassy sea lion right here. You can even tell her attitude by her facial expression. She owned the place. And then there's a great blue heron and they just wait all day because they do get handouts, fish scraps at the end of the day. So here she is begging, she's looking at this fish. And I just couldn't stop taking pictures and videos. I have some amazing videos from the fish market. This beautiful gull is called a lava gull. Perfectly, perfect name. And like gulls everywhere, someone left a bag of bread 
and the goal was in it in like 10 minutes. He was pigging out on bread. So here we have a goal in the Galapagos eating bread. They're the same everywhere. This is what the port looked like. It was so pretty. Um, fishing is a, you know, a huge part of the lifestyle there on these islands. Here she is. I thought she was going to take his cell phone out of his pocket. <laughs> I loved her. This is another sea lion at the fish market having a siesta. You guys, I'm so close to this animal. She didn't even open her eyes. And again, most of my photographs are of wildlife, but um, the towns, the people, beautiful, very colorful. This is what it looked like in Puerto Ayora in Santa Cruz. Lots of shops, also lots of um, tourist shops. These were the native lobsters. I can't remember their name. They're beautiful. And then we went to El Chato Ranch, which is basically a, um, this is where you see the tortoises in the wild on Santa Cruz. Land is preserved for them on this ecological reserve. And this was my first encounter with tortoises that weigh hundreds of pounds and are 100 years old uh, grazing. And I don't know if you've noticed that, so on Santa Cruz, even though it's drought season, it's very different environment. We were shrouded in fog. It was lush. It was green. There's so much food for them. And again, you must stay at least six feet away from the animals. So this sign sums it up. Do not touch the tortoises. I can see how you would want to. And so I'm actually sitting behind this tortoise. I am not touching it. Um, here's an example. You know, they're just grazing everywhere. And um, from the port to this El Chato ranch, we took a bus and on the way to the ranch, I would look and there would be tortoises, sometimes on the sidewalk, grazing with cattle, grazing with horses. Never in my life did I ever think I would see tortoises grazing with cattle. You know, it's just wild. It's not anything we see in this country. You see gopher tortoises in Florida, but they're not quite as large. Um, here's tortoises sitting in this uh, primordial soup. There was a pintail here. Just spectacular creatures. And one cannot take a picture of a creature so large without taking a picture of its feces with my foot for a size comparison. So these guys are mega herbivores, vegetarians, and they're poop is very large. Again, beautiful um, bright colors for the pollinators. Okay, so I think, oh yes. Okay, so then we, we left. I was sad to leave Santa Cruz, but I have to say the boat is just so comforting. No matter where you are, you see this beautiful mothership waiting for you in the background, and it's home. Um, and so I was sad to leave that island, but I was grateful for the day and happy to get back on the boat. And then there's dinner, there's a presentation, and you go to sleep and wonder what the next day will bring. And the next day brought Dragon Hill, Guy Fox, L. Eden, and Daphne Major. And those are um, islets and I think small islands here above Santa Cruz. And so this was a really beautiful site. You can see, um, again, a lot of volcanic remnants, pinnacle rock in the background, black neck stilt. There are birds on the Galapagos that are also can be found here. And this location is where we saw what they really meant by drought. And so uh, cacti, there was not a lot of green vegetation. And those land iguanas I was telling you about earlier, they live an interesting lifestyle. I think it was 83 degrees this day, which was the warmest day. And um, our guide said that these guys, these land iguanas, they are not thinking about breeding. They are not thinking about territory. The only thing they're thinking about is survival. And they're actually waiting under their favorite cactus for the fruits to drop because that's all they have to eat 
in these times. So imagine the lifestyle of sitting days, weeks, months, waiting for fruit to drop under a cactus. It's an incredible lifestyle. There, is, there was some green, still some water. You can see the sediment is, um, looks clay rich, volcanic um, topography. And here's where I finally was able to see uh, adult blue-footed boobies up close. And you can see what a spectacular and also goofy creature, right? Those beautiful blue feet and blue bills. I love this image because it looks timeless. Uh, this is an immature blue-footed booby, and these are all uh, Galapagos shearwaters flying around it. Um, afterwards on the boat every evening, I loved going to the top of the boat. There was always a captain cocktail and um, frigate birds would ride the bow of the boat. And so you had this incredible day. You settle down with an, an Ecuadorian beer or a fruit, native fruit drink um, and watch the birds ride the bow of the boat. So beautiful. And here's what a typical evening would look like um, at the top of the boat for the cap captain's cocktail hour. Um, and you get to mingle. They also had evenings where they would do stargazing from the top of the boat. It was very, very special. <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to share with you my favorite, favorite, favorite highlight of the trip. So um, our guides told us that we would see Galapagos penguins. And there are only about 2,000 to 3,000 Galapagos penguins in the world, remember, and they only live in the Galapagos. Remember, they're the, it's the northernmost range of a penguin because of that cold, humble current. And so they said if we saw two or three penguins, that would, that's a big day. That's like a big group. So we were excited. So we went out to uh, Bartolome, which is here. So you can see we sort of worked our way through here. Um, southeast towards west, um, and Sombrero Chino, which is an island named because it looks like a Chinese hat. Okay, so <laughs> this slide is a little bit of out of order. It should have been in the beginning, but when you're at the equator, you need to protect your skin uh, because you're closest to the sun that you're ever going to be, unless you're in a spaceship with NASA. But anyway, um, I bought this awesome scarf. There's a gift store on the boat. And I bought this awesome booby scarf for my head. And at first I felt like a dork, but then everyone was like, on my Zodiac when we were going out, they were like, where did you get that? I'm so glad I bought it. It's my most favorite souvenir. So here we go. We were getting ready. We're going to see penguins today. Here's the Chinese hat. This is Bartolome. This is so special to me. This has to be my most favorite photo. Um, so we saw a few penguins in the water here when the Zodiac was pulling up to the shore, but I wasn't able to get a good look at them. And then um, I went snorkeling around this pinnacle. And I just wanna show you what the penguins look like. They're very small, beautiful birds. Um, and this is what they look like when they're just sitting out on rocks catching the warmth. Okay, so what happened next was awesome. Highlight of the trip, you guys. Um, so my snorkeling partner, my head was in the water and my partner said to me, I heard him saying, Stephanie, Stephanie. And I picked up my head and he said, the penguins are coming right at you. And so you're gonna see, you're gonna see some little heads here and I'm going to play the video. Um, so that was incredible, you guys. I didn't see two penguins. I saw nine, and they swam right by me. Um, and then this video was the highlight of the boat for the rest of the trip. Everyone was like, even the Nat Geo guides were like, are you the one with the video? Can I see that? Um, so I'm going to play it again. And so you see the little heads, and then I, I'm so glad I went under the water with the GoPro and captured them. And they were so close. You can see the air coming off of their um, 
waterproof feathers. And then I was laughing at the end because I just, I was in hysterics. I couldn't believe what I had just seen. So, you know, and this is not just me. It's anyone who is in the water. I happen to get lucky because they swim right by me, but you're in the water with all these amazing creatures. And then I was one of those people who was late getting back to the Zodiac because I was swimming back from the penguins. I was super excited. And then I saw this. And this video is going to be a little bit jerky, so I apologize. So that is a white tip reef shark. And you probably can't see it, but the, the first dorsal fin has a white tip. The top of the tail is a white tip. Uh, and I just, you know, the shark, the shark didn't even care that I was there. I just swam over it. It was doing its thing. Um, people would be very large prey for this animal. And I was in awe. And then I came up, I surfaced, and I heard people yelling my name and like, are you coming? Um, so I got back to the Zodiac and... I'm so glad I captured these videos. I almost didn't take the Go, I almost didn't use the GoPro, you guys, because I felt as though using it would take away from my experience. It didn't at all. In fact, I feel like it has helped me to relive the experience over and over and over again and to share it with you. So, you know, it's, it's strapped to my wrist and I just click the button. Okay. So this was our last day. This is the island of Genovisa, and this is also referred to as Bird Island, and you will see why. And um, we, we take the zodiac, we go to this island, and you see these pinnacles of rock, and at the top is so many birds, red-footed boobies, excuse me, frigate birds, everywhere. And there are these Prince Philip steps, and here's our guide, his name was Christian, and he told us, okay, you guys, this is the frosting on the cake of the trip. And I was like, how could this be the frosting on the cake? Because everything has been amazing. Um, well, he was right. Because when we got to the top of the Prince Philip steps, this is what we saw. This island is called Bird Island because it hosts the largest red-footed booby colony in the world. Over 40,000 red-footed boobies nest there. Also nesting there are Nazca boobies, frigate birds. There might be some blue-footed boobies, I'm not sure. Also nesting there uh, is the largest colony of storm petrels on the planet. Millions of birds and four different storm sp petrel species. So this is the Nazca booby with their chicks. This is what the landscape looked like when we got to the top of those stairs. Um, basically on the top of a flattened volcano, um, very dry drought season. Even so, all the birds, if you can see the white, these are all Nazca boobies nesting. This is my group walking. Whoops, I went backwards. Um, I had to take a picture of the footprints in the sand because the footprints were so beautiful. They were a work of art, all the bird prints. This bird was just chilling, incubating an egg. No bother. And here's an example of how close we are to the animals, and they seem relatively unfazed. I loved the pattern that their feces made. They look, look like a mandala. Uh, so beautiful. And Nazca boobies, they're one of my favorite. Here's a video of a chick. This was also a warm day, warm being less than 83 degrees. And so you can see this bird is panting. Um, birds do not have sweat glands. They don't have the ability to sweat like we do. So they basically flutter their chin. It's all gular fluttering and through, and their mouth is open. So through evaporative cooling, they uh, cool off. It's much like a dog panting. So that's a Nazca booby chick with a good patient parent. Um, this video, I'm going to be quiet because this is an example of how awkward these birds are. And at the end, you are going to hear their very beautiful, whimsical call. To me, it sounds like um, a silly straw that I had as a, as a child that made a really high-pitched whistling noise.
Uh, I hope you could hear that. And you can also see the locomotion, which is kind of awkward. And that's because um, birds in this family, the boobies, pelicans, cormorants, frigate birds, they have what's called a totopalmate foot, totally palmated or fully webbed. And all their toes are connected. Their four toes are connected in webbing. Unlike a duck, which would have three toes connected in webbing and the hind toe is free. And so these birds make these big, beautiful footprints. But um, the purpose of those feet is not for big, beautiful footprints. They actually incubate eggs with those feet. They're highly vascular. And it also aids in um, swimming and diving. So look at this red-footed booby. When you think about Galapagos, everyone thinks blue-footed. Um, and red-footed are just as spectacular. Look at these colors. And again, there's 40,000 of them on the island, you guys, nesting. This is a juvenile red-footed booby. I can tell because of the downy feathers, the fresh new feathers. He's a light brown. And also, he doesn't have that extraordinary coloration to the bill yet. But even so, he's still colorful. He's a rainbow. Everyone was sleepy on the island. Maybe it was the heat. And again, I say heat, and it was less than 82 degrees. This is a striated heron. This is a frigate bird taking a siesta. I had to take a picture of this, you guys, even though I know it's just a big bush. There were several different species nesting in here. Can you see, I call him George Washington. When the young frigate birds have all the white around them, it looks like George Washington's wig, all the fluff. And all these birds were like bickering because there were so many birds nesting in one spot and they like to be, you know, within beak stabbing distance only, no closer. So funny. Um, so here are just some of the examples. Look at the red feet on these birds. And again, we're walking so close to these animals and they re remain unfazed. This is an immature red-footed booby and I know this because of his coloration. He does not have red feet yet. Okay, so I told you that this Genovisa is also home to the largest storm petrel colony in the world. It's in the millions, and I can't remember the four species. But I also was recognizing that I was seeing the carnage of petrels around, and I was wondering what on earth eats them out there. And then we saw this. And by the way, these are all, these are all pictures from my, my trip. Uh, my friend Rob took these great photographs we were actually able to see this bird grab a petrel out of the air, which, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to see that, uh, but it was fascinating to see. And we have short-eared owls here in Massachusetts and on Cape Cod, but in very limited um, numbers on Cape Cod. Okay, so here's the very end of my trip. So on this trip, I spent so much time in the water, you guys. Anytime I could be in the water for snorkeling, I was. There were some days where there were two snorkeling opportunities and I, I was there. And this was the last day and I was feeling sad. And I almost didn't go on this trip. I felt like, okay, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a rest. And I'm so glad I went on the trip because it was, a, it was a proper goodbye for me to say goodbye to this beautiful place. So we go to um, the Darwin Bay of Genovisa and we see swallowtail gulls breeding, nesting. Swallowtail gulls are the only nocturnal gull in the world. And they are, they were the one, they really captured my heart. And I'll show you why I have um, some beautiful photos of them. Here is a Genovisa mockingbird. And so again, um, if it's named after an island, that means it's endemic only found there. Um, I talked earlier about Galapagos sea lion creches or nurseries. Well, this is a booby nursery. All of these young birds <laughs> waiting for adults to come back and bring them food. And one of them landed on this girl's head. And I think she is probably the most photographed person on that entire voyage because everyone was taking pictures of her. The bird was on her head for like 30 minutes. The sand was so beautiful. It was on this beach, largely fossilized coral. And as much as I would have loved to have taken a piece of it home with me, 
Galapagos is very strict about what goes in and what comes out. Um, you cannot bring any pieces of food or anything to the islands. Um, they're extremely worried about non-native species being introduced to the islands. Um, you also cannot remove even a speck of sand to bring it home with you. But that's okay because there's also wonderful souvenirs that you can purchase on the boat. And also when you're in Santa Cruz, you have the day and you have um, opportunities to shop. So these, I don't even know what to say about the swallowtail gulls. Look at the colors, you guys. They're just magnificent. Look at this bird. So the red around the eye, it's stunning. And um, they're nocturnal. And so the red is thought to help concentrate light um, to the retina so that these guys can see better at night. This is the one bird that made me cry. Um, George Washington right here, frigate bird, Nazca boobies. Um, I took this photo, I love this photo and it was so fitting because never in my life have I been to a place where animals seem to exist in relative harmony. You know, there's definitely, there's predation, <laughs> but I've never seen such large volumes of animals living together and also uh, filling different niches. This is my saddest, most sad photo of the trip. This was um, the last day where we had to return all of our snorkeling gear. And uh, this is a beautiful photo though, isn't it? It's so colorful and um, that gear was used very well. So my last slide, um, I call this presentation the untouched lands, but that is hardly the truth. To us, they seem untouched. But Galapagos was first discovered by the um, Europeans when the Spanish had arrived in 1535. And Galapagos in Spanish, I believe, means bewitching. Because most of the year, several of the islands are shrouded in fog. And because the islands are 600 miles offshore, it was not thought, the archipelago was not thought to be very hospitable until the mid 17th century when the whalers found it. The whalers found that it was a great place to haul in their catch um, and they decimated the forests on the islands. They introduced domestic animals like pigs and goats who absolutely decimated the vegetation there. Um, the tortoises suffered immensely because all the vegetation was being consumed by the goats and the pigs. I believe there were dogs. Um, and so in 2006, the last of the goats were removed from all the islands. And in 2000, the last of the pigs were removed. And that's relatively recent, you guys. Invasive species pose a huge threat. I told you that there are over 2,000 endemic species out there. Endemic, meaning they are only found in this archipelago. So imagine non-native species are introduced that threaten or aggressively outcompete those native species. <laughs> um, climate change poses a huge problem for Galapagos because they are finding that um, there's more intensified storms, uh, rising seas, warming waters, making food availability, um, and um, food distribution challenging for some of the species of animals, but also they've been finding that periods of El Nino and extreme rain are often followed by extreme drought. Um, illegal fishing is a problem. You probably have all read in the news recently that there's a fleet of like something like 367 Chinese fishing vessels right on the border of the, this UNESCO heritage site and Ecuador is in a state of alert. Um, they cannot fish in that location. Um, but honestly, because Galapagos is so remote, it is very difficult for Ecuadorian government to monitor illegal fishing. Plastics do pose a problem. I did not see a speck of trash on any of the islands. It was pristine, but I did, being who I am and in my field of work, I did ask the question about plastics and they do see um, impacts on wildlife from plastic ingestion and entanglements. Finally, 
um, oil spills. I couldn't believe, if you remember on the news last year, two weeks after I got home from my beautiful life-changing trip, there was an oil spill in one of the harbors in San Cristobal. And I think it was 500 gallons of oil. And then it went hush. And I still cannot find any information on this other than it was 100% contained. And we all know that, that when they say that anything is 100%, that's simply not true. And we also know from experience from things like the Gulf spill that oil spills last forever. It trickles down, it's uh, in the water, it's in the sediment, it's in all of the marine life. So time will tell what the impact of that spill was. Um, I had a field guide with me. They call it a pocket guide, but it's a little bigger than anything that could fit in your pocket. $14, it was so worth it. What I love about this guide was it also included plants and insects and breeding and distribution timing. All the islands are different, you guys. So I wish I could tell you red-footed boobies breed in December on all the islands, but that's simply not true. As you've seen, the climate is very different on each of the islands, and so these birds are actually breeding at different times of year um, on the different islands. The good news, the trip that I am leading next year, October is a great time to see uh, basically everything that I just showed you here uh, breeding and uh, abundant. And I didn't mention this, but of course, I was on the boat with National Geographic. So I'm going out, every day you're going on a Zodiac, you're snorkeling, you're walking, you're listening, you're learning from National Geographic naturalists and photographers. So these are some of the top guides in the world. And one of my absolute favorites from the trip was Tom Peschak. He is one of only a handful of actual paid staff wildlife photographers for National Geographic. I highly recommend you give him a follow on Instagram. He has over a million followers. His photography is extraordinary. And I had the opportunity, well, we all did, to spend a lot of time with him learning about his work. And then he provided a couple of presentations on the boat. So aside from all the walks, the snorkeling, the kayaking, you're with these people um, who are teaching you everything you could ever know about the Galapagos. And I think, oh yes, so we are going to go to questions. And I love that photo. And I also want to um, make sure you all know that if you would like to come with me in October, we would love to have you. And um, if you have any questions about uh, booking, reservation, cancellation policy, Nancy Bradford is the local travel agent who has arranged this. And that is her email. And now I'm going to hand this over to Rebecca. All right. Um, we did have a few questions that I did answer some of them as we went. And I do want to remind everyone if they are thinking about going to the trip, um, I just put the Zoom link for the um, Q&A with Stephanie and Nancy Bradford will be on that as well. That's going to begin. Um, in about 17 minutes. So we're going to wrap this up pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> you can log into that for 830 and she'll be sort of answering more personal questions if you want to ask them. Like if you have questions about your room or dietary restrictions or her personal experiences with the travel, um, how the staff treated you, you know, she shared some really fun things with me that I think um, would make it make me feel more comfortable about going. So if you're interested in doing that Q&A because you're sort of on the fence about going, I just put that Zoom link in the chat so you can copy and paste it there. Um, we did have more than one person ask about touching the wildlife, which I did sort of answer that, but if you want to maybe address that for anyone else that's curious. Yes, sure. So the guides, um, they always stressed that we must stay at least six feet away from the animals. Um, and thank goodness most people respected that. I did find when I was snorkeling, because you're always with a group, when you snorkel, you always have a partner and you're always with a group and you always have a guide. And I did find um, 
that sometimes people would reach out to touch the sea lions. And I, you know, we shouldn't do that. That's when accidents happen. And I can tell you, you're so close to them already. I mean, there's no need to touch them. They're right in front of your face. And um, the only human animal interactions that I saw was the sea lions. They come close to you because they're so curious. So like the sharks, they had no idea I was even there. Um, the fish know that you're there, but they're not, they're not trying to interact with you. Um, and what else? Yeah, the birds, you just walk by them, they don't even acknowledge you. So really, I think it, it is the best place in the world for wildlife um, encounters and photography. I hope that answers the question. And the guides will yell at you if you get too close to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, did you see any sea turtles? I did, I saw on the first day when we disembarked in San, um, San Cristobal into that port, I saw a Pacific green sea turtle swimming. And my one regret from the trip, the only thing I did not do was uh, the first kayaking trip. And when people got back, everyone was just like, they were so excited. And they said they were at eye level with flamingos and they had about 65 green sea turtles swimming with them. Ugh. So yeah, I was like, I'm never, I'm not taking a nap again. <laughs> it was the only thing I decided not to do and I missed that. <laughs> but yes, there's Pacific green sea turtles in abundance there. Do we have any other questions? Um, it looks like you answered everything that people asked about your trip. A few people have asked about um, fees and how to book the trip. Um, I've added Nancy's, you can see her email there, so you can always email her. I've also added her website to the chat. It's nomadictravelcompany.com. If you go to that website, she has her cell phone number is on there, her email is on there. The itinerary for the trip is on there, so you'll be able to find that, and that will answer a lot of your questions about pricing and, and timing and dates. Um, so if you're curious about that, that's right in the chat function. Yeah. So before we let all of you go, I will just remind you, thank you so much, Stephanie. This was insightful and wonderful, and I hope lots of you are planning to join her next October, because um, the more of you that go, the better it is for wild care. <laughs> Part of this trip is a fundraiser for us. We are a donation-based organization and we can only do the life-saving work that we do with your help. So if you enjoyed this talk or you'd like to sign up for any of our other educational talks that we'll be doing throughout the fall, we'd love to have you. Um, we'll be advertising those things through our emails and through our Facebook. We're pretty, pretty big on our social media. So if you'd like to join us there, give our Facebook a like and you won't miss anything. Um, and also, if you enjoyed this and you want to support Wild Care, you can go to wildcarecapecod.org, and there is a nice big Donate Now button. I think it's blue, right there at the top. So you can click that. Every $5 matters, and we thank you so much in advance for your support. And for those of you that already support us, we thank you very, very much. So I will let you all go, and if you're logging on, the next talk starts at 8.30, and Nancy and Stephanie will be there to greet you. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Good night.